So, um, you're number 10 in the Cambridge Structural Database in terms of those deposit structures. Yep. Right? So, can you tell me why you chose the Rocky equipment over other vendors for your work? It all dates back originally to when I first started my independent career. Um, I'd used um, another manufacturer's equipment up until then. And um, I was looking at various bits of equipment to start my own independent career. At that stage, um, it was part of MSC. Well, MSC was part of um, Regatta. It was just in the time before it was completely taken over. And um, they had an office in Dusseldorf. And I went over there just before one Christmas. Um, I had two small boys there, which may sound odd, but I went over there with two small boys and we went into the offices and my eldest son, as we entered, ran over and switched off the generator. Now if that happened with the equipment I was using um, back in my workplace, uh, there would have been all hell to play, it would have been hours before anything even had a chance of going. And uh, the man in charge of the machine there just said, not a problem, leant over, pressed another button, and it restarted instantaneously. And I think it was that point, I knew that was the kind of reliability of hardware that I was looking for. Um, coupled with that, um, over the years I made a few trips to Houston as well um, to look at the other sorts of equipment. And even on times when I haven't bought the equipment, uh, which was near the start, um, although subsequently bought it from the market, I was always impressed by the, the people there. And to me, um, the the reliability of the equipment has to be seconded by the reliability of the people who are using it. I've always liked the people who've got they've always been down on with me, and so um, I've stuck with them. Thank you. What were your thoughts on the brand image of the doctor at the time you made your first purchase? The time I made my first purchase, very few people in the small monitor world had um, even heard of them. But again, apart from the reliability of the, the hardware, the, the people, whenever I emailed them to ask questions about the software, they were always willing to give it a try. So even though I would have said the image was not perhaps the greatest in the small world of the world, I personally was convinced, and to me, I've never been one um, to follow trends just for the sake of it. So I just went with it. I just went with my gut. Thank you. What about now? Now, I would, I would say they still do have a a slight problem just because of the um, all pervading influence as it were of George Shelby in his time with Booker. It's very hard to shake George's influence um, and quite rightly, you know, he's a, a massive figure in crystallography and his time with Booker has always worked to their advantage. But actually as the years have gone by and software developments have become much more um, accepted, I think it's become easier for people to buy other brands of software and although you should be able to use the software independently of the hardware, the two still have quite a time, I think, in a lot of people's minds. So I would say it's improving. And actually, I think the, the time with Oxford fraction will have helped from that point of view. Because, um, in my opinion only, when um, Oxford fraction started, people who weren't happy with Booker were happy to buy another kind of version that, but that wasn't regarded. And they were always seeing the faces of the software. And it's very hard on them to go back on what they thought was a big plus. So if you have the reliability of regard your hardware, which I think was never in any doubt, especially because all the protein people and a lot of small molecule people, that's about what they think, have protein colleagues, they always knew the reliability was there. And since they've now been seeing the praises of the Oxford Defection software, with the two being married together, I think it's going to be a lot harder for them to come up with. And it's not just them wanting to buy it, it's when you write a grant and you put that you want to buy software, sometimes you have to argue with the, the grant people, especially if it's sometimes not as competitively priced. Um, so actually I think the merger will have helped with Arco overall in, in a lot of different ways. Thank you. Um, so tell us about your current research interests and goals. As always, a very broad mixture of research interests. Um, part of that's been to do with um, the places that I've been, but also the equipment that I've got. I'm lucky in St Andrews to have a wide range of equipment from um, small mini type systems to the rotating anodes of the robot. So I'm able to work across all spheres of chemistry. 
so we have um, people that are interested in like lithium ion batteries, so I've been doing more work in that kind of area. The moths are always a big area, and of course the copper rotating anodes is really good for that when you're trying to look for small bits of stuff that are trapped in small voids. Um, we have a big catalysis section, so we do a lot of NHC work in catalysis in general. Um, we do a lot of main group chemistry, so I have a lot of um, interest to do with um, phosphorus, selenium, tellurium type compounds. Uh, our head of school currently is a big fluorine chemist. He's also interested in protein crystallography of fluorine compounds. But he also is interested in a lot of um, musk oil type compounds. So we have quite a big interest in flavoured and scented compounds. None that I've actually spelt myself because they're all small details. But in theory, they're, they're good for receptors. So really, I think there's probably not a field I've not interested in. I've always had a big interest in supermolecular chemistry because again when I started um, I did a lot of work in that area and that's just been a continuing thread throughout um, my career. But really, anything that comes up I'm, I'm game for. So can you elaborate on the how you collaborated with uh, that you work with on the various projects? So, probably the, the most well-known of them is Fraser Stoddart. Um, I started work with him way back when I was a PhD student at Imperial, and we've actually continued that collaboration on and off throughout the years. Uh, I was at Imperial until about 1990, and so I was, a lot of my early papers were with Fraser when he was in the UK at um, Sheffield and then Birmingham. And then I, was there. I started my own independent career, and Fraser um, moved over to the States, starting off at UCLA. So there was a divergence for a bit. Um, but then, when I moved to St. Andrews, and I think it was at the start of the time when he moved over to um, Evanston, we reconnected again, and we had a joint grant. I think it was the first grant he had when he went over to Evanston. So again, we reconnected then. And of course, I'm going to pretend it was all due to that, that he, he got his um, Nobel Prize. But, um, Fraser is obviously a very important figure in um, supermolecular chemistry. As again, are some of his students, so uh, Dave Lee, that I've worked with on the for my career. Um, David Williams, who was my um, PhD supervisor when I was at Imperial College, he was also a big mover in the early days of supermolecular chemistry. And a large number of my high research publications are with uh, David and Fraser, and sometimes Howard Colquhoun, who's now a professor of chemistry up at Reading, but um, back then was. Um, working at ICI, which is a good industrial time. So, um, so all those people have been inspiring, not just because of their energy and their smartness, but just the fact they work hard. It's much easier to do um, good science if you work hard. So, um, what other instruments do you use other than the X-ray device? No, I'm, uh, I'm probably one of the few last people who have been appointed post where I can just do x-ray diffraction as a research tool. We're lucky in the UK that still counts as an academic position. I know um, people in the States don't always have that same um, ability and they're treated more as staff members and as a service. But um, there are people in the UK who are beginning to go in that direction, especially as the machines become more complicated and the software becomes more able to deal with tricky problems. So it's inevitably going down that route. People have had to pick more um, diverse careers when they're doing crystallography, maybe and synthesis. But I've been lucky in that I'm, I'm probably one of the last people who was appointed to, to just focus on crystallography. When crystallography goes well, almost anybody can do it. When it gets trickier, you do need, I think, somebody who specialised in it to be able to get the best out of a sample or to analyse the results. And um, I'm lucky to be able to sort of just to do that. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but how often are you using the single crystal equipment? Well, apart from weekends, and even then sometimes I come in, it, it's every day. It's, to my mind, equipment works best when you're using it all the time. It, it's not like something where you can just uh, turn it down and turn it off on special occasions. The more times you try something, the better. And even if you've got a rubbishy sample, you might as well, and as I say, I'm lucky in the number of, of equipment I have. If you put on a dreadful crystal, you might be lucky to get something out of it. You might not be able to publish it, but you might help the chemist. And so it's always useful to put on a sample, even if it doesn't look worthwhile at the time. So um, <laughs> you use your equipment all the time. Can you describe how you keep each piece 
the equipment um, fully occupied. Perhaps a better question being, you know, okay. what can I do with more equipment? It's, it's not a problem to keep it occupied. There are all these people, um, and not just the people I collaborate with currently, I always have people emailing from overseas asking if I can do samples for them. Um, it's, my biggest problem would actually be train people to run the equipment these days. Again, because of what I alluded to earlier with the way the crystallography is looked on perhaps now more as a technique rather than as an academic position, it's quite hard to get people um, to want to do PhDs just in crystallography. Uh, they have to do something else, um, synthesis or, or NMR or something like this. So often when people start with PhDs, you start them on a, like a, a joint um, track part. If you're lucky, they'll stick with the crystallography. Um, but I've had people who've started on both of them and then they've stuck with synthesis or they've stuck um, maybe on the solid state MR. Because it is hard to do both things equally well and there aren't that many job opportunities in crystallography. So it's more getting the trained people and keeping the equipment running because of manpower rather than samples. Samples isn't the issue. Can you describe a typical day? So a typical day I like, I like to start putting on the samples straight away. Um, at the moment I'm running one side of the, you can see behind me the, the copper um, motor and it's got two ports. My um, research assistant runs one side of that and um, one side of the molly um, rotating on the upstairs, which is exactly similar apart from being molly um, as far as it goes. So I would all, because with the molly you can put more samples on per day, I would always start by putting on a sample on the molly rotating anode. That might take, uh, if I'm lucky, that only takes 10-15 uh, minutes. I've already got um, a long list of my week's work mapped out, so I usually know which sample I'm trying to put on. The first one I try to put on Molly should be one that has no issues. It doesn't always go to plan because until you've actually put the crystal on, you can't be sure that there are no issues. But I would tend to put on one that I think is going to be quite easy, well diffracting, pop it on, get it finished. Then whilst that one started collecting, I then mount the one for this side, come downstairs here, mount this one, usually because the, the copy just has to move in a lot more places to collect the data, um, I'll set up just one per day. You can, if it's a really strong crystal, put two on the copper, but generally it would just be one per day. So I'll set the other one going, come down, do the copper one, um, then I'll go back upstairs, uh, check the unit cell on the first 360 frames, which usually it's gone up to. Usually as well, I have a, a default strategy for the copper that collects a hemisphere, whereas on the molly I'm much more inclined to use the strategy option in order to use the, the, the best use of time. So it could well be, um, in an hour I'm already put on the second sample on the molly. Sometimes I might be two or three hours, depending on how the first one's worked, I move them into two or three per side on the molly. So, but by about 10 o'clock I would already have an idea of when the first one will finish on the molly. If I'm mounting stuff on the robot, I would tend to mount that um, after I've got that, that gap in the middle. I then might come back and do something on the um, second body, or if I've got a gap, then I would go and check my emails, maybe do a few refinements. Um, then, again, I'd put the refinements on the molly. Quite often, I would do um, refining of structures in the afternoon, because that's when I tend to not have to do so much. Um, and sometimes as well, leaving at home. If the one on the copper is finishing at say 6 o'clock, which uh, um, a 10 second data collection would typically be on the copper, then I can VPN into the system and I can have it um, processed and solved at home. So the next day I don't need to spend time doing that, I can just carry straight on. And then it's rinse and repeat, it's the same thing over. Thank you. So over to my left, which you can't see in the video, yep. there's a crystal SEX. How do you use that? So, that's the one of the few machines I have that I let um, ordinary, ordinary people, <laughs> people who aren't me, um, touch. So, I've not only trained, I've got one PhD student, but he uses that a lot, although he's going to be trained on the rotating anodes um, after he comes back from the course that he's on. In fact, even today, he's been today for the course. But other people from other groups can use that one. <coughs> Excuse me. The mini um, I let people use because there's very little they can wreck on it, and so I don't mind too many people being hands on that. The rotating anodes, I like people to be more trained on before I even uh, trust them to do it. 
but when the Molly um, is, say, temporarily down, if we change the Philips server, the Mini is still the system that I'll collect data on myself. Um, in fact, I think I used it just the other week when they fill it up. Because there's no point owning a machine that you can't get good data on that you can publish. There's no point having that Mini if everything that I run that has to be repeated on the machine. So I've used all machines at all points. Now, upstairs you also have an Acura system. Yep. And how do you use that? So, a lot of that is done where we have, um, that, that would be done more on the inorganic systems that are air stable. So we have a lot, not quite the, well there are some of the people from the moth groups, but they're more um, metally clustered sometimes. Sometimes they turn into moths, sometimes they just focus on metal clusters. Um, what's good about that is that sometimes they have lots of different phases and they may want um, a particular phase and it's quite easy to get sick of them, frankly, if you're down here on the rotating anode, um, you stick on the crystal, you're not sure, because a lot of the, the crystal systems are quite similar to each other, and you're not sure if you've got the correct phase or not. And whilst you're trying to maybe three or four crystals on there, you could actually be collecting data on, on something, um, let's say, more worthwhile. The beauty about the active system is I can uh, mount, say, 12 crystals of one sample all at one go, and because you're doing it all at one go rather than sequentially, not only can you pick good crystals, but you can actually pick bad ones on purpose, or ones that are a bit more clumpy than a bit more uneven. <coughs> Excuse me. And because you're doing them all at one go, the chance of you getting a different phase is actually increased. Plus as well, you can just mount them. Now, here we have a variety of different philosophies. One of my students prefer to just do unit cells in the daytime, and then use the evening to um, collect on what they thought was the correct one. I prefer to just collect data. Then the ranking system tells you the better ones. You look at the best rank one first, check the unit cell, if that's the one that you want, then you can go ahead and, and solve it and carry on. Um, but mostly it's really useful as um, a workhorse. Anything simple that you don't have to worry too much about, so it's very good to put on that. And that actually frees up more time on rotating angles. So you can waste time a bit more than you want. You need to get a drink of water? No, I'm okay. okay. All right. So um, I know you have a long publication list. Mm -hmm. uh, approximately how long is it these days? 1,100. Thank you. <laughs> I need All peer-reviewed articles. Oh, yes. I don't think there's any that haven't been peer-reviewed. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have any other users besides yourself? So I have a research assistant, um, I look into it, Dr. David Porter. He uses two sides of the um, uh, ports on either rotating anode. Um, I've generally had one student that's pure crystallography, but there will also be different students throughout the year. And depending on who they are, they use the mini, the robot, and sometimes the rotating anodes. Okay. Um, so, give me your impression of the Rodaku kit as you see it today, and where you think we should make improvements. Ooh. What's your wish list? My wish list. I think my wish list would be for the software to be more transparent. There are bits about the software that, that seem to me sometimes to be very black boxy. Um, I remember I had that issue a long time ago with them um, when HKL 2000 was, was part of the suite and I looked at it and I just couldn't understand what was going on. Sometimes I think that versions of D-Star um, and the integrated software were more transparent to me few years ago than some of them are now. It was just easier to not um, to tweak, shall we say. I could I could with parts of um, the Star Trek, I could manipulate the unit cells far more easily than I can now. Now I think the software is trying to be so clever that when you want to force it to your will, you can't do it. That's not to say that your will is always the correct one, but sometimes it tries to overcomplicate things when you want to make something simpler. And bearing in mind that at the end of the day, it's all just model fitting of some kind, so long as it's a good working model. 
that you actually know. I know the truth is out there, but sometimes there are various truths out there and you just want a good working model. And, and which particular model you go for at which time, it's sometimes harder to make the software do these things um, for reasons that, that aren't always obvious to you. In terms of hardware, I actually can't think of anything much that's poor about the hardware. That's really bad. I should pretend there's something that's really <laughs> that I really would like. And even with the software, I can't rule out the fact that I'm getting older and getting more set in my way. So maybe it's just uh, a lack of flexibility in my thinking. Although I've always been pretty good at being flexible. I'm getting older, and so it's obvious that I'll be less flexible. Well, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to the world about the doctor equipment? I've stuck with it for a lot of years, so I must say a lot about it. I've always been happy with the people behind it and the philosophy behind it, and that's mostly why I've stuck with it. All right, thank you.